Dearly beloved, thank you for joining us indoors on this glorious Good Friday afternoon. As if the storm two days ago never happened, and it was just the figment of our imagination. How true that is for this holy week. Sunday morning will make Good Friday seem like a figment of our imagination. Thank you for coming here into this simple building. But that simple place becomes a sacred space because of the love that brings us together. Grace United Church, as most of you know, and some of you are new here, you've never been here before, Grace United Church is a welcoming community of faith where the mission of Jesus continues to be alive and makes a difference. We strive to be the voice of the voiceless and not just be advocates and make noise for the sake of making noise, and to walk with the marginalized and carry them through their difficult and dark moments as well. We strive to walk with them and accompany everyone as we are able. And that's what God asks, to do our best and leave the rest to the Spirit of God to do the work. This community of faith acknowledges all traditional territories that we live upon, and we give thanks for all the generations of people who have taken care of these lands before us and still do with us today. Today's presentation is truly a very special one for me because it takes me back to the year that I met Eleanor Glenn for the very first time in my life, and I was a student minister in Elgin, Portland in 2009. So today's presentation of the servant, as the servant at the Supper is a gift from Eleanor, and her desire is that all free will offerings be dedicated to the Benevolent Fund of Grace United Church, extending help to the less fortunate in our greater community. Those online watching this live stream or recorded later on, please go to our website and consider to partner with us. One last note. We want to invite you to please hold your applause in your heart and praise God for this gift of this day. And let our hearts and minds be focused on the message of what Eleanor is sharing with us today. You have an order of ceremony here, or order of gathering. So I invite you for the invitation to Good Friday, and it is responsive. The bold print is your part to respond with. We begin. Today, God makes common cause with our human suffering, like the disciples we gather in the upper room and realize that suffering is not rational. It has no answer. However, in the cross, God meets us in our suffering. From this day forward, we know that this day is Good Friday is God's Friday, because there is nowhere we can go where God is not with us. Friends, today's One Woman Play has been performed for more than 16 years to countless audiences of all backgrounds all over the world. 
You may get to know Eleanor a little closer by reading the back of your bulletin. However, it is worthy to mention that Eleanor's mission and vision is something to announce about right now. Her mission as an author, actress, public speaker, or in one-on-one -on -one conversations. Eleanor's miss mission is to lift up, support, and encourage others through her words and actions. Her vision is to consciously develop an ever higher awareness of creative opportunities to expand her mission statement and touch more lives. If you think your community would like to host Eleanor, please talk to her after this event today. At this time, please join me in your hearts for our opening prayer. Today, O oh God, we stand near the cross, disturbed, distraught, discouraged. As we imagine Jesus crucified once again by the injustice of this world. But we gather as your children, filled with the hope of a resurrection that transforms the world. On this dark Friday, may we soak in the darkness of God where love abides forevermore. Help us to be aware of your truth as we await patiently for the dawn of a new day. We pray humbly. Amen. Dearly beloved, without any further ado, we present to you the servant at the supper. Two days before the feast of Passover, Jesus sent his apostles, Peter and John, into the city of Jerusalem. There, they were to look for a man carrying a large alabaster jar of water. They were to follow that man to his home, and upon their arrival there, they were to ask him if Jesus and his followers might eat their Passover meal in his large room upstairs, already furnished. The man that they followed to the house that day was my father. My name is Polythia. And I am the servant girl who baked the bread and served the wine at that most memorable of Passover feasts. When Jesus and his followers arrived in our upper room on that evening, the candles had been lit around the gray stone walls. Large cushions had been pulled up to the long cloth-covered table. I had already placed the bread and the wine on the table. Before the apostles took their places and the man they called Jesus took his place at the center. I then quietly left the room to allow them their privacy and to get more wine in case they might be in need of it. And sometime later, as I was returning to the upper room with another jar of wine, 
a man brushed past me in the doorway, causing me to spill some of the red wine on my clothing. I heard some of the followers of Jesus shout, Judas, don't do this. Don't go. Come back. But the man, this Judas, was gone. And as I bent down to begin cleaning up some of the spilled wine, I happened to look up and I saw the man Jesus take the bread, the bread that I myself had baked that very morning. And he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body. And then I watched as he took the cup of wine, the wine that I myself had poured. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Take and drink, all of you. For this is the cup of the covenant, which will be poured out for many, for the forgiveness of sins. I watched as the apostles passed the bread and the wine, one to the other. There was a reverent silence in the room as those words, this is my body, this is my blood, were implanted on each one of our hearts. <laughs> I knew that I could not fully understand the magnitude of those words, and yet I knew that I was witnessing what many of the early followers of Jesus Christ at that time in Jerusalem were calling miracles. Yes, I had heard of this man, Jesus, who healed the sick, made the blind see, and even raised a man called Lazarus from the dead. And as I looked into the eyes of Jesus, and then to the bread and the wine, which still looked like bread and wine, I thought, if this man could actually make still hearts start beating again, then how difficult would it be for this bread and this wine to become his body and blood? And the answer? that I saw there in his eyes is that it would not be difficult at all. Not long after this, I heard them softly singing a hymn. And then they left our upper room to go out into the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of the Mount of Olives to pray. The next morning, as I was going about cleaning the room, I heard a 
large crowd passing by on the street below. So I went to the window to see what all of the excitement was about. And someone cried up to me from the street, they're going to crucify Jesus of Nazareth. And I thought, no, this cannot be. This cannot possibly be. I must go and see this madness for myself. Later, when I arrived at the hill of Golgotha, which means place of the skull, I could already see two men hanging on crosses in the distance. And at that same moment, a third cross was raised up into place between the other two. I heard the sickening thud as the base of that cross was lowered into the ground. And they had placed an inscription above him, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The very size of that cross blocked out the sun shining in the sky behind it that day. And it was indeed the torn, battered, and beaten body of Jesus Christ that those Roman soldiers had nailed to it. The crown of thorns that they had placed upon his head caused rivers of blood to flow down his face. And I remember thinking as I stood there, Lord, if the whole world could see you as I see you now, hanging there on that cross, they would know that you are God. And I looked down to the right of that cross. One of the followers of Jesus was standing there. It was the one they called John. And he was standing with a small group of women. I thought that I heard someone around me say that they thought one of those women was the mother of Jesus. And then I thought I saw the lips of Jesus move. And I watched as John reached out his arm, putting it protectively around one of the women and taking her in to his own. As time went on that afternoon, I realized that it wasn't the size of that cross that was blocking out the sun shining in the sky that day, but rather a strange darkness had come. 
and it covered the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at that time, the clouds opened up, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And the rains came. It was as if the whole world were crying. And the thunder rumbled and the lightning flashed. And many who had gathered there on that day to see this spectacle, they ran back home again, beating their breasts. all of his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee. He stood at a distance watching these things. Early that evening, when I returned to the upper room of my father, many of the apostles had already gathered there, for they were now in fear for their own lives. And as I was about to Remove the articles from the table. Simon Peter commanded me in a loud voice, No, leave the dish and the cup as they are. And let us take comfort in the words of our Lord and Savior, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so it was that that dish and the cup remained there on that table. For the rest of that day and all of the next, as a sign to all of us who gathered there in this upper room, that Jesus Christ truly had been crucified on that cross for our sins and for our redemption and whose body was now truly in the tomb amongst the dead. When the Sabbath was over and we had rested, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, took spices so that they might go and anoint him. And when they return to our upper room, a short time later, 
the words that they had for Peter and the apostles astounded us. He is alive, 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 he is alive. And many days later, after Jesus had been caught up and a cloud carried him away out of their sight, once again the apostles returned to the upper room of my father. And there they stayed and prayed until the day of Pentecost had finally come. And on that day, there came a roar of wind like a mighty tempest blast, and it filled this whole room, and tongues resembling fire were separated and distributed on each one of their heads. I looked on in awe at these men who had been so filled with fear since the physical departure of Jesus, now stepped out boldly with authority and conviction, proclaiming that Jesus Christ was the one true God. I watched them touch many in the room that day who simply fell to the ground in awe of the Holy Spirit acting through these 12 men. I went once again to the window and watched them go out into the street, healing hundreds that day and bringing thousands to Christianity. And as the days and the weeks and the months went by, I watched countless numbers come from the surrounding hillsides and towns and villages to hear the apostles tell the stories of Jesus Christ. I watched them baptize countless numbers, tell groups that their sins were forgiven, and always, at every gathering, was the bread and the wine, becoming the body and blood of Jesus Christ through the power and authority given to the apostles by Jesus Christ at what has become known as the last Supper. In 37 AD, my father died. And that same year, one evening, a man came knocking on the door of the upper room. He was short in stature, with a balding head and a hooked nose. He introduced himself to me as Paul. He said that he had come down from Damascus to Jerusalem, not just to visit his sister, but to seek out the one that we now simply called Peter, because Paul wanted to learn as many of the stories of Jesus Christ as he possibly could. So Peter 
then sent Paul to me. Because Peter felt that it would be imperative for Paul to see this upper room where so many of the important events in the earthly life of Jesus Christ had taken place. And so I showed Paul my clothing, still stained with red wine from that night so many years ago of Judas' betrayal. I showed Paul the window where I had stood on that Friday morning when the Roman soldiers and that large crowd passed by with Jesus carrying his cross. I described for Paul the darkness, the emptiness, the torture of that crucifixion. I sang for Paul that glorious hymn of resurrection that we had sung on that first Easter Sunday morning. I stood once again on that very spot and described for Paul the coming of the Holy Spirit as it filled this whole room. And I showed Paul the table the table of the Last Supper, the cup of Christ, the wooden cup of a simple carpenter. Paul listened to each and every one of my stories. You could tell. He was memorizing each and every word. And when I was finished, Paul looked at me and he said, Blessed are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. And Paul then went on to explain to me that since the death of my father, I had now become the keeper of this upper room. And as such, it was therefore my mission, indeed my ministry, to tell everyone that I came in contact with Everything that I had seen, heard, witnessed, and believed had happened in this upper room. And after Paul left that evening, 
I spent a great deal of time thinking about what he had said. Because my brothers and sisters in Christ, the question for all of us then becomes, where are you in this upper room? Where are you? Are some of you perhaps currently like Judas with your back to Christ and yet over these last months perhaps for some of you years have you heard your family and your friends as the apostles cried out to Judas saying to you don't do this don't go come back because Jesus is always ready to meet us where we are No sin is ever too great to be forgiven. No sin is ever too great to be forgiven. If you had been standing at that window, on that Good Friday morning, when the Roman soldiers and that large crowd passed by with Jesus Christ carrying his cross, would you have dropped everything and gone rushing off to Calvary's Hill? Or would you simply have stood there at that window and watched Jesus Christ pass you by. If you had been standing on Calvary's Hill at three o'clock on that afternoon, when that thunder rumbled and that lightning flashed, would you have rushed home again in fear and in terror? Or would you have stood there silently at the base of that cross? Would you have joined us? On that Easter Sunday morning, in that glorious hymn of resurrection? Or would you have stood with Thomas and said, Nope, not me. I will not believe until I see. Have you ever taken the time to study and to learn about the gifts of the Holy Spirit? And which of those gifts God might be calling on you to use now, today, in the building up of his kingdom here on earth?
Blessed are the feet of the messengers who bring the good news. You know, when Paul spoke those words to me here in this upper room, Paul was not speaking those words for the first time. Paul was quoting those words from his favorite prophet, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Because you see, my brothers and sisters in Christ, the message is so simple. The Last Supper, the crucifixion, the resurrection, Pentecost is the good news. The good news is timeless. The good news never changes. Only the feet of the messengers change. Six hundred and eighty-one years before the birth of Christ, the feet of the messengers were Isaiah's. In 37 AD, when he came to visit me in this upper room, the feet of the messengers were Paul's. <clears throat> On this day, this Good Friday, April 7th, 2023, The feet of the messengers are yours. The feet of the messengers are yours. One bread. One body, one Lord of all, <laughs> one cup of blessing, which we bless. And we, though many, throughout the earth, we are one body in faith in this one Lord. And so, my brothers and sisters in Christ, go forth from this upper room and bring the good news. <laughs>